Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Revitor Rampage Precon from Streets of New Capenna and its face commander, Henzi Toolbox Torre, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Henzi Toolbox Torre is a 3-3 Devil Rogue that costs a black, a red, and a green with the following abilities. Each creature spell you cast of mana value 4 or greater has Blitz. The Blitz cost is equal to its mana cost. Blitz cost you pay costs 1 less for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. Breaking down his core stats, Henzi is sporting a fairly low to the ground CMC, a typical stat block for his cost, and a pair of abilities that enable us to get our larger creatures out quickly, albeit temporarily, but being hasty and cantripping upon death to make up for it, all while casting them at a discount that only gets better the more he's been cast. Looking deeper into his first ability, it effectively takes all our high CMC creatures and turns them into sorcery speed cantrips with bodies attached. Because Blitz grants haste, we're guaranteed that the creature will be able to swing in at least once before it sacks itself at the end of the turn, making it quite useful to speed up slow and vulnerable creatures with powerful attack and damage based effects. And thanks to the creature sacking itself at the end of the turn, any creatures with death triggers can easily be enabled without the need for sack outlets, making them much more reliable. And with the added bonus of drawing us a card no matter how they die, they'll either be replacing themselves at the end of the turn or can be used along Alongside other sack effects to generate us even more value. This then pairs very nicely with his second ability to grant those Blitz creatures a 1 mana discount for every time we cast him, meaning we can get our big creatures on board ahead of curve and make use of their abilities even faster. And should our opponents decide to remove our commander, it only makes blitzing out our creatures even cheaper. So as we can see, Henzi wants us to blitz out big creatures at a discount, enabling them to get their ETB, attack, damage, and death triggers off, and finally replacing themselves upon death, which is why this precon upgrade will be focusing heavily on creature value to get the most bang for our buck as we do just that. That of course means we'll be keeping the best selection of big ETB, attack slash damage, and death trigger creatures that the core build has to offer, and further augmenting it with our own potent additions to ensure we can maximize the number of creatures that can make use of Henzi's Blitz granting. And to squeeze out even more value out of our Blitz creatures, we'll be further beefing up the core build's arsenal of sack effects and death payoffs with additional entries to ensure that our Blitz out creatures' limited lifespans are put to better use by enabling us to sack them for value, permanently reanimating their brethren, or even cheating other creatures into play. So let's get on with it, since Henzi charges by the hour and his services don't come cheap. But while his rates are certainly high, you can't argue with the results. You need anything, Toolbox can get it for you. You need someone dealt with, Toolbox will hit him hard and hit him fast before they even see it coming. Just make sure you pay in full after the job, otherwise you may not see it coming either. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's go over the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Starting off with the creatures that made the cut from the core build, we'll be aiming to keep the most potent ETB, attack, and death triggers the core build has to offer right out of the box. Solemn Simulacrum, for example, stays in because it turns into a land ramp draw 2 spell for only 3 mana when blitzed, making it a great source of value that only gets better if we have death payoffs or other sack effects to get even more value out of it. More offensive options like Indrik Stomp Howler, Noxious Gear Hulk, and Woodfall Primus also make the cut, their ETB removal and big stat blocks enabling us to clear problematic cards, swing in, then replace themselves, with the latter even coming back into play thanks to Persist to remove something else and leaving behind a 5-5 Trampler for us to use on following turns. Green Warden of Marasa and Artisan of Kozilek get to keep their spots as well, the former giving us some solid 2-for-1 recursion on ETB and death for any cards in our bin we may need back on a decent sized body, while the latter's enormous stat block, ETB reanimation, and Annihilator 2 on attack make it great for blitzing in, sacking to our opponent's permanence on attack, and bringing back another threat from our grave to be used again. Giant Anaphage, Tree Shaker, Chimera, and Itali Primal Storm will also be carrying over from the core build, their biggest weakness of being slow being fully compensated by Blitz and allowing them to get their token creation, mandatory blocks and draw, and free spells right away instead of being forced to wait a turn and risk removal. Deathbringer Regent also manages to keep its spot, the fact that it's a board wipe on a body being relevant for recursion, and leaving behind a 5-6 evasive body to swing in with after the wipe being decent upside if not blitzed out. And finally, our last creature holdover is Avenger of Zendikar, whose combination of land focus token creation and counter distribution alongside our color's massive access to land base ramp makes it quite deadly, allowing it to quickly flood our board with tokens and make them massive before our opponents even have a chance to react. 
Continuing on to our Instant Keepers, both Terminate and Chaos Warp make the grade as solid removal options to deal with creature and permanent threats respectively for relatively low cost. Moving on to the sorceries that made the cut, the Cordex Land Ram package consisting of Farseek, Rampant Growth, Kodama's Reach, and Migration Path all get to keep their spots, as they each provide the build with great ramp and fixing to ensure we can build our mana base quickly and have access to the colors we need. Life's Legacy and Victimize will also be staying in, the former allowing us to cheaply turn our big blitzed creatures into additional card advantage before we have to sack them, and the latter using them to fuel a 2 for 1 reanimation spell instead to bring back creatures we blitzed out on previous turns. And lastly, we'll be keeping Blasphemous Act as a good and potentially cheap board wipe in our colors to help stabilize the board if things get out of hand. Proceeding to the enchantments that made the cut, both Evolutionary Leap and Industrial Advancement carry over as solid sack outlets, the former cheaply allowing us to use our Blitz creatures to dig for more creatures from our deck, while the latter actually lets us use them to cheat our high CMC creatures directly into play with its polymorph-like effect, ensuring that our creatures not only draw upon their death, but also guaranteeing they get another creature to replace them to our hand or to the field. Next of Kin stays in as well for a similar reason, allowing us to replace the enchanted creature with a creature from our hand or even Henzi himself from the command zone when it dies, making it another easy way to cheat our big creatures into play with the added benefit of coming back into play over and over again. Then Garrick's Uprising wraps up our enchantments kept from the core build, its potent combination of card draw and AoE trample for our creatures ensuring that we can get even more card advantage as we blitz them out, and that they can get in for damage more reliably. Artifact Keepers are then up next, with Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and Felwar Stone all keeping their spots as excellent sources of ramp that help speed up our mana base and or fix our colors. Lifecrafter's Bestiary then closes out our artifacts, its cheap creature focus draw and scry on upkeep helping us more easily dig for creatures and get more value as we play them. Skipping over walkers and moving straight to our core land base, Command Tower, Path of Ancestry, and Savage Lands all stay in since they can tap for any color in our tricolor build. Mossfire Valley, Shadow Blood Ridge, and Twilight Mire keep their spots to provide us with some solid filtering to help fix our colors. Cinderglade, Smoldering Marsh, Foreboding Ruins, and Game Trail all make the cut since they can tap for two of our colors and we're running enough basics to make sure they come into play untapped. Exotic Orchard stays in as it can usually find us mana to use off our opponent's lands since we're in three colors. Thriving Bluff, Thriving Grove, and Thriving Isle all keep their spots for being on-demand fixing for any color we may need when they come down, and Blighted Woodland and Myriad Landscape both stay in for the ramp they provide our build from the land slot. Kessig Wolf Run also gets to keep its spot here for the on-demand trample and pump it can provide our creatures to ensure they can get in for even more damage. And finally, all four swamps, five mountains, and six forests from the core build make it in as well. That leaves us with a final tally of 61 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 39 cards to replace. So now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to the upgrades. Starting off with our creature upgrades, we'll be adding a small handful of cheap sack outlets and death payoffs to help get us additional value out of our creatures, and a huge pile of big creatures with impactful ETB, attack slash damage, and death triggers to make the most out of our on-demand blitz. Firstly, we'll be swapping out the random defender creatures from the core build consisting of Overgrown Battlement and Weathered Sentinels, both of which feel a tad bit out of place here, with Dockside Chef and Ravenous Squirrel, both serving as sack outlets that hit the board early and allow us to convert our Blitz creatures into even more draw, and in the latter's case, growing larger and larger as more creatures are sacked away. Caldea Guardian and Disciple of Bolas also get cut here, the token generation and burst of card draw they provide not being worth their inclusion, instead being replaced with Sakura Tribe Elder and Grimharo Specs, providing our build with additional ramp and incremental card advantage instead, which helps the build run smoother. Then moving on to some more attack and damage focused upgrades, Wave of Rats, Grime Gorger, and World Shaper's lackluster attack and damage effects are swapped out for Champion of Ronus, Charnel Horde Worm, and Kogla the Titan Ape, whose cheat creatures into play, creature recursion, and back row removal on attack are a bit more impactful, with the latter two being heavy hitters we can get a lot of value out of if we choose to hard cast them instead. Similarly, Inferno Titan, whose ETB and on attack damage is pretty good, is being swapped out for Vivictus Asmati the Dire, whose identical stat line with added evasion and AoE Chaos Warp like effect make it a better beat stick and source of disruption. And while yes, its removal does also hit us, it can be potentially beneficial to help us cheat out big CMC creatures off the top of our deck. We'll also be swapping out the solid removal spell Wind Grace's Judgment and the not so solid Board Wipe Aether Snap for some more removal on bodies in the form of Ravenous Chupacabra and Terastodon, both still providing our build with some good removal that we can blitz out for cheaper while being more easily recurrable to be used again. Changing gears now to augment our death trigger creatures, both Metonic Slime and Thrag Tusk, whose token creation upon death is nice but not groundbreaking, will be swapped out for Sea Guide Ash and Kura the Boundless Sky, whose huge land base ramp or mass land tutoring slash token creation are much more impressive. 
For the same reason, we'll be exchanging Crush the Bloodbraided and Stalking Vengeance, which are okay payoffs for our large creatures, for Rampant Rejuvenator and Gamekeeper, both of which fit our deck's overall playstyle better with their death-based ramp to grow our mana base and polymorph-like effect to cheat bigger creatures into play, respectively. Then we'll be swapping out the expensive but flexible Riveter's Confluence for the slightly cheaper but equally as flexible Vindictive Lich, whose table-wide Edict Removal, Hand Disruption, and Life Loss are quite potent, and again, because he's on a body, is easily recurrable for us to use again and again. The Creature Bouncing Duo, consisting of First Responder and Teamer Sabertooth, will also be replaced here, since we would much rather have our Blitz creatures die to get us the draw and proc our payoffs instead of going back to hand for nothing, with Deadwood Tree Folk and Timeless Witness taking their place, each giving us potent and repeatable sources of recursion for anything in our graveyard, which works much better for our game plan. In a similar vein, Jolene the Plundering Queen and the Beamtown Bullies, whose unique effects will find a better home in builds of their own instead of playing second fiddle here, will be exchanged for Genesis and Balroth Null to give our build even more ways to recur our creatures from the bin, and make sure we can blitz them out for value over and over again. Then we'll also be swapping out Mezio Mugger and Bellowing Mauler, whose theft and edict removal effects are a bit lackluster here, for Phyrexian Delver and Chainer Nightmare Adept, the former giving our build some solid reanimation and the latter enabling us to blitz our creatures out of our graveyard, both allowing us to further use our graveyard as a resource. And then in an effort to swap out some of our non-creatures for additional bodies, we'll be cutting both Painful Truths and Death Reap Ritual, which are respectable draw sources themselves, for the Tutors, Hoarding Dragon, and Magus of the Order, each allowing us to either tutor an artifact into our hand or green creature into play directly, which serves nicely to add some additional consistency to our build. Dodgy Jalopy will also be getting scrapped, as most of our creatures will be too busy swinging in themselves to be able to crew it, and its scavenge being a bit awkward to use since so many of our creatures are going to be sacking themselves due to Blitz, being swapped out instead for Vorapede whose Undying will keep it on the field permanently when blitzed, and making its good stat block and keywords even better. And for our last creature upgrades, we'll be swapping out the Hideaway Land, Spine Rock Knoll, and Mossworth Bridge for Summoner Egg and Clone Shell, both of whose death triggers to cheat creatures into play are easier to enable than the Hideaway Lands, and, because they're colorless, can even be blitzed out for free if we've cast our commander enough times. Moving on to our instant upgrades, our only change will be refining our removal slightly by swapping out Riveter's Charm, whose effects are a bit too niche for us to use properly in this build, for Beast Within, giving us another reliable and flexible removal option to deal with a wide variety of threats. Proceeding to our sorcery upgrades, we'll be buffing up our ramp package by swapping out the subpar ramp spell Explore and the forgettable fixing Ash Barons provides for Cultivate and Primal Growth, both of which provide our build with additional cheap land-based ramp to continue speeding up and fixing our mana base. Continuing on to our enchantment upgrades, we'll first be swapping out Turf War, which is a bit too chaotic for this build to use, and exchanging it with Myth Unbound, which effectively halves Hansi's commander tax while it's out, and gets us additional card advantage as he's returned to the command zone, generating us even more value as our opponents remove him or we sack him away ourselves. Then we'll be swapping out the trio of Reign of Riches, Warstorm Surge, and Protection Racket, all of which are either too niche or too expensive non-creature spells for what they do, and replacing them with Vampiric Rites, Phyrexian Reclamation, and Riveter's Ascendancy, all of which fit better with our game plan to provide additional sack-based draw, creature recursion, and creature reanimation, respectively. Nearly at the end now, our artifact upgrades will consist of changing out the Mana Rocks Glittering Stockpile and Commander Sphere, since we have so much better land-based ramp and rocks in the build already, for Witch's Cauldron and Cauldron of Souls, the first serving as an additional cheap sack outlet card advantage source for us to use, while the latter lets us keep our creatures when they would be sacked by Blitz by granting them Persist, making them slightly smaller but still letting us keep the body and getting the draw while reprocking any ETB and death triggers they may have. And lastly, for land upgrades, we'll be swapping out Temple of the False Gods, which is much too unreliable to ramp us properly in this build, with Grim Backwoods, giving our build another sack based source of card advantage, this time from the land slot for it to take advantage of, and finally exchanging Temple of Malady, John de Panorama, and Riveter's Outlook for a swamp and two forests, to add some additional basics to tutor up with the large volume of land based ramp we have at our disposal. So now that we've covered all 39 cards we'll be upgrading from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this pre con upgrade. This deck currently has 38 creatures including the Commander, 3 Instants, 9 Sorceries, 8 Enchantments, 6 Artifacts, 0 Planeswalkers, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have a total of 33 creatures of CMC value 4 or greater, 14 creatures with ETB triggers, 18 cards with death triggers for themselves or others, 6 creatures with attack and or damage based triggers, 12 sack effects and outlets, 8 cards that let us cheat creatures from our hand or deck into play, 5 cards that let us reanimate creatures back from our graveyard, and 8 cards that let us return them back to our hand instead, leaving us with a full third of our deck that can take advantage of our commander's ability to blitz them out and the discount he provides them when doing so, all of which have a selection of attack slash damage, ETB and death based triggers to take full advantage of it, alongside ways to sack them for even more value or get them back into play permanently from our hand deck or grave, or alternatively get 
them back into our hand instead to be blitzed out again. For general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 12 car draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp being a bit higher than normal to allow us to hardcast our creatures or pay for our commander's commander tax more easily in the later game, while our other core stats fall within more typical ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 6 1 drops, 8 2 drops, 13 3 drops, 12 4 drops, 9 5 drops, 7 6 drops, 5 7 drops, 2 8 drops, and 2 9 drops. Giving us a mid to late game curve that's actually much faster than it initially appears due to our high volume of early game ramp and ability to blitz out our creatures at a discount, enabling us to get our heavy hitting creatures out by mid game to impact the board heavily with their abilities and bulk, after which we can convert them into additional value before they sack themselves away. The final price then comes out to be $74.48 after upgrades. This price does not include tax and assumes that the price you paid for the pre-con was $40. The pricing of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For additional upgrades, the Slowlands Rockfall Veil, Deathcap Glade, and Haunted Ridge all help speed up our mana base even further. Wall's Itora's Proving Ground is another tricolor land to help fix our colors and is fetchable by anything that fetches non-basic forests or non-forests. Ryusei the Falling Star, Atsushi the Blazing Sky, and Junji the Midnight Sky are all big evasive bodies that have potent death triggers to make use of Blitz, as is Kokusho the Evening Star, who's yet another evasive beat stick that possesses an on-death AoE drain to hurt our opponents and pad our life totals. But by far the best and most expensive upgrade would have to be Machaeus the Unhallowed, who provides all our non-humans with a plus one plus one bonus and, more importantly, undying, allowing us not only to keep them when they die to Blitz or any other means, but bringing them back even stronger. Just be sure you're ready to pay to exhume him though, since he's certainly not cheap. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. With Riveter Rampage covered, our next precon upgrade will be covering Obscura Operation and its face commander, Kami's Obscura Oculus, so look forward to an evasive damage trigger focused build featuring her soon. But before we close out, again be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already as this channel cannot grow without your support, and if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description, and if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut raid commander episodes i've made so far and with that have a good one folks and stay safe